This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, greetings, dear friends. Hope you're excited to see us as we are to see you. This is the Georgia Fire Monitor. Right now, Mr. B with that all-important lineup for this week. And needless to say, Ray, it is a good one at that. Straight ahead on the program, the important topics discussed at this year's Pecan Growers Meeting, as well as news of a new marketing campaign. Also on the program, John Holcomb on how this Paulding County Elementary School turned a rundown industrial space into a beautiful outdoor classroom where kids are able and excited to learn. Plus, a near-fatal car accident took away his career and passion of being a surgeon. But through it all, he persevered and was able to find a new calling, one that's earned Daniel Moy the title of Master Bladesmith. These stories and so much more starting right now on the Farm Monitor. With Georgia being the nation's largest supplier of pecans, accounting for nearly a third of the U.S. production, it's vital for the farmers to be up to date on the latest research and technology. That's why the annual Georgia Pecan Growers Conference is so important as it brings each aspect of the industry together under one roof. Damon Jones was there and has the story. Whether you call them pecans or pecans, there is one thing everyone can agree on. They are a delicious, versatile nut that the state of Georgia has specialized in. And the entire industry recently gathered in Tifton for the annual Georgia Pecan Growers Conference to check out new equipment and get advice on how to maximize yields. And one important suggestion is to pay special attention to your older trees. Pecan trees, as they age, they get big and old. And a lot of times those big old trees, while they can still be productive, they have a lot more alternate bearing. And uh, with the practice of hedging and, and uh, hedge pruning those trees, it invigorates the tree, stimulates the tree, and just makes them more consistently productive from one year to the next and improves the quality as well. Even though harvesting season is still far in the future, it's still a critical time for growers when managing their orchards. You know, it's time to get out there and start uh, burning down those herbicide strips between the rows and time to start fertilizing. And probably within a couple of weeks, we'll be spraying uh, fungicides for scab, uh, for young trees, uh, ambrosia beetles are active this time of year and so they need to kind of be on the lookout for those and treat those if they need to. And this is an important season for growers as last year's crop was significantly cut into by Hurricane Irma. We estimated about 30 percent damage on the crop and that seems to have held up pretty well you know with uh, nuts blown down, uh, limbs broken out, trees blown down, um, and then also as we got into harvest, we saw some quality issues that were related to the storm from when those nuts were getting beat around up in the tree. However, there is some good news as those affected by the storm are now eligible for some government assistance. We've just heard that uh, the ECP money for uh, help with assistance for cleanup through that storm has, has come through. And so they just need to make sure they get with their FSA offices and fill out all the paperwork they need for that. One of the biggest issues facing the industry over the past decade has been the lack of marketing. But thanks to the Pecan Federal Marketing Order, that concern has become a thing of the past. We have, we have three pillars. And, you know, the first one is nutrition and, and how healthy it is and the good, good aspects of eating pecans as part of your diet. The second is the, the heritage. It's a native nut grown here in the U.S. And then taste and what a good tasting nut it is just by itself. That message is about to go nationwide as the American Pecan Council is rolling out a new marketing campaign later this month. It's the culmination of a plan years in the making. We've been working on this for about five years, where for three years we went out and really talked with our constituents, the growers and the processors, and said, what's important to you? And, and what do you think as an industry we need to do? And it, it, it just excites me so much because we all know what a great story we have, and we have the ability to tell it. And to be able to roll this out nationally, it's the most exciting thing in my professional career. Reporting from Tifton, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. In other ag news, Chinese tariffs pose harm to U.S. agriculture. With China buying nearly 20 billion in U.S. agricultural products annually, the tariffs, 25 percent on pork and 15 percent on other agricultural products, present an almost certain decrease in farm exports to the region. 
American Farm Bureau's Dave Salmonson says the effects of the tariff will be seen soon and adds that another tariff announcement could trigger more retaliation from China on U.S. ag. The president has announced there'll be some new tariffs proposed on up to $60 billion worth of Chinese product imports. This comes from a different part of trade law and a different issue dealing with how they treat our intellectual property. This wouldn't take effect probably for another two months, but you may expect some retaliatory moves from China related to that. We've been through this in the past. Over time, usually things get worked out. And here, the background policy that started all this is a lot of overcapacity of steel production in the world, a lot of that related to Chinese production, and that's a process that needs to be addressed. So hopefully that can be worked out and U.S. ag products won't be facing these retaliatory tariffs for very long. In the meantime, in recent years, school gardens have sprouted everywhere as teachers search for engaging ways to educate their students about where their food comes from. But there are a lot of work and require support for more than just the teachers. The Monitor's John Holcomb visited one such garden at McGarrity Elementary in Paulding County and reports on how it would not be possible without all hands on dirt. It's not a sight that you see every day. Kids outside and actually enjoying being there. But here at this elementary school, and also in schools all around the state, it's becoming a common occurrence, all thanks to school gardens just like this one, that have been popping up the past couple of years. Almost two years ago, McGarity went through a remodel, first remodel we've had in 25 years. And this space here was industrial. It was large air conditioning units um, behind this awful looking fence in the middle of the playground. And I knew that the air conditioning units were going to be taken down, so I thought, well, let's turn this industrial space into something that is good for the environment. Um, I said, let's build a garden. And build a garden they did. They have managed to transform that old industrial space into this beautiful school garden. Of course, this wouldn't be possible without a lot of help and dedication from other teachers, parents, and even the community. With something, a large project, something like this, um, it takes a lot of people. It takes a lot of dedication. It takes a group of people that you know are willing to put in the work. Another big help in the success of school gardens comes from UGA Extension. They send master gardeners to the schools to help get the gardens established. We focus on sustainable gardening right now, and our school programs offer programs that show children what they can grow in their own backyards, what they can take home and eat, and how to grow that, and how to bring it into the community. Other than teaching the kids where their food comes from, they can also serve another purpose. School gardens can be a great way for the school to meet education requirements called STEM once the school has been certified by the state. STEM is science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And it's all of those core contents combined to um, kids will not just do science. They'll not just do use technology. They're not just learning math. They're learning everything in an integrated way in a project-based learning type environment. And those projects are popular. So popular, the garden has almost tripled in size. And they have started to work in the garden all year long. They even started two different programs to allow as many kids to be a part of the garden as possible. One of them even lets the parents be a part of it. The children come out and work with their garden club teachers once a month um, and with their designs and they come out and they work in the garden on those days. We also have an earth parent program and they come out on other earth work days. We have four of those a year. Um, they come out, they help us paint, they help us build. As you can tell by the excitement in their faces, it's an enjoyable time for the kids and for the parents. Deganar says the work days are a big hit as it creates a great environment for the families to be together. There's a lot of excitement about it and a lot of um, enjoyment when they come out and work in the garden because they get to come out and be with their kids. And they get to do something that's very stress-free, um, not just homework, you know, not going to a ball game, coming and actually working together to create something beautiful and to also learn where food comes from. Reporting in Paulding County for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. When we come back, forging steel into an exquisite knife, it takes the patience and skill of a surgeon. A titled Daniel Boy once held before a terrible car accident nearly ended his life. His amazing story when the Farm Monitor continues.
Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue kicked off another USDA Back to Our Roots tour in Ohio. He was joined by Administrator Linda McMahon of the Small Business Administration as they met with rural business owners. I'll tell you, it was terrific today to be out with Secretary Perdue. It's really important, as he and I both have said, to get out among our consumers and our constituents and see what it is they do. How can I advocate on behalf of small businesses if I don't visit them and see what their issues are? So it's our first uh, visit together. This arose out of an executive order that President Trump signed over agriculture and rural prosperity. And Linda really took it to heart, understanding that farmers are small businesses too. We look forward to helping our small businesses and, uh, and those that are farms all around the country, you know, to grow and to thrive and to succeed because then we all succeed. So thank you so much for being here. What she and I are doing here is understanding and uh, making it formal and official by signing a memorandum of whether it's the SBA that needs to step in and help our constituents or the USDA. Since the advent of time, farmers have relied heavily on their trusty knife as an important tool of the trade. From a tiny pocket knife to a custom blade, it is pretty much with them at all times. But do they know the history behind that knife or the incredible effort it takes to forge one? Daniel Moy became a knife maker as the result of a horrendous car accident that nearly ended his life in 2009. A life that was spent mostly in the operating room as a prominent orthopedic surgeon in Watkinsville, Georgia. Well, unfortunately, the accident forced Dr. Moore to give up that life, but as you're about to see, he still crafts every blade with the utmost care and precision of a surgeon. There was a gentleman in 18-wheeler who was lost and was trying to get his directions and he turned into me head on and I was in a Prius and it just ramped right up on top of the hood of the uh, right on top of the ceiling of the driver's side. They had talked about trying to get my legs removed at the scene but they couldn't get a general surgeon to come do it and then they helicoptered me to Grady where I in the next 24 hours, I coded like nine times. I was in the hospital off and on for about a year and a half. Uh, when I first got out of the hospital, my good friend, a physical therapist, worked with me literally every day for about a year. When I first got out, I hadn't taken, well, after a year and a half, I had not taken one step, not one. Initially, I was told I probably wouldn't walk, and then I was told I probably wouldn't walk without a, without a walker or crutches or something, and then a cane and then I was able to walk without any of those things. I do have some nerve damage, and, uh, but I, I owe a lot of it to him giving me the time. For years, I talked about making knives, and I'm not sure exactly why, it just seemed like something I'd want to, I'd would, I would want to do. My daddy did a lot of woodwork and stuff, and, and I'd done that growing up, but, I, but I, I just had always thought I'd make knives, and one day I was uh, discussing this with a good friend of mine, and he said, you know, I'm tired of you saying this. He said, you know, you either need to make, you've been telling me this for years, you need to either start making knives or you need to quit making, or hush. What I say it, to people, it, it keeps my hands busy, my mind still. I mean, I, you know, I, I, it's, I never thought I would, I, I loved being an orthopedic surgeon. I, I really did, I'll start tearing up here. I love, and I thought I would be the one that they go, Dr. Moy, 
you need to, you're, you're contaminated, you're sitting on the operating room table, you need to get off and go home, it's time to retire. I really, I loved it. I really, I, uh, I loved every day. And uh, I never thought I would find something I liked as much. I do a lot of custom work, and what I do with custom work is I talk to the client, the customer, friend, and they tell me what they want, and what I do is I'll draw out a pattern. I draw out a knife. But I tell everybody, especially people I don't know, that the knife will not look exactly like that. I will make it as close as I can because it's not a pattern for the knife. It's just something for me to have an idea on if, if they won't know what they want. And so what I do is I'll draw out something and it's usually close. I've never had anybody say, no, that didn't look like it. But it may be a little bit longer, a little bit thinner, a little bit, you know, it, it's, it's gonna be very, but it should come out fairly close. But like today, in, in the majority of time when I'm, I'm making a custom knife, what I do is I just kind of visualize it as I go. I do try to make them attractive. I do some hand file work on the spine. There's some patterns you can put on that to make it just to kind of make it look nice. My biggest complaint is people say that they they, they find them, they're uncomfortable using them because they're, they're uh, I hate this, this sounds horrible, but they're, they're too pretty. And I said, no, they're made to use. We can, they'll still be pretty. I mean, yeah, but, but, uh, but I want people to use them. I'm glad I was an orthopedic surgeon, more so than I'm a bladesmith, even though at this point, I really love bladesmithing almost as much as I do of being an orthopedic surgeon. I enjoy doing it, not, and I do sell knives, it's not, and that's not the point for me. It, I enjoy doing it. I made 40 or 50 knives I've got in a drawer before I sold a single knife and because I wanted them to be what I thought was right and uh, but it's it it comes as close because when I'm doing this stuff when I'm doing something with my hands orthopedic surgery or this I'm, I'm, I'm in my in a different mindset He is amazing, isn't he? And don't forget, if you missed any part of the story or others on today's program, you can still see them in their entirety at our YouTube channel, The Georgia Fire Monitor. Plenty of stuff to choose from. The archive goes all the way back to 2009. And while you're there, keep clicking and like The Georgia Fire Monitor Facebook page. Send us some feedback as well. If you have a story idea or if you just want to leave us a comment or suggestion, send us a message either on Facebook or at the address on your screen. That is news at farm-monitor.com. Now, when we come back, going from grassland to a thick forest in a generation, Charles Denny with more on the history and future of an effort to restart nature. Stay tuned. A hillside gets a new beginning, the birth of a forest almost from scratch. The Tennessee Valley Authority has a long partnership with the UT Institute of Agriculture and now another ambitious project. Foresters and students are planting 700 red oaks on TVA's Norris Dam Reservation in Anderson County. The trees will be protected by cages a few years to keep hungry deer away. Northern red oak is what we call a fine hardwood species and that's one of the most valuable hardwood species. Relatively fast growing oak, uh, good for timber, of course good for wildlife too. Scott Schlarbaum leads UTIA's tree improvement program. Here back on the Knoxville Ag Campus, the planning crew sorts the trees. Expectations are high for this crop of red oaks. This orchard will produce acorns uh, that will have an another increment of genetic improvement and uh, then will be used eventually for mass reforestation in the Tennessee River Valley and also in eastern Tennessee and other, other associated areas. This site has been treeless for a while now, but it has history. This area used to be covered by hardwoods and loblolly pine until about 15 years ago. Now the experts believe the red oak should thrive here. The seedlings are about a year old and come from good stock, descendants of a past orchard. Here's footage from 2011 of TVA's work with UTIA at Watauga Lake near the Cherokee National Forest in Carter County. 
The trees going in the ground now at Norris were from a collection of seeds from the Watauga site, first planted nearly half a century ago. So in a way, these seedlings are coming back home uh, to TVA. TVA experts say their organization has a mission to replant the valley, and it won't be long before the public can enjoy this forest. It should be, yes. It's probably going to be quite park-like once the seed cut, once the trees get up a little bit and the canopy cover kind of closes in around that area. Uh, it'll be quite nice for probably some hiking and, and picnicking and that sort of thing. A landscape can dramatically change and reappear with the right planning. And this future forest is the result of work done today and in the past. This is Charles Denny reporting. Finally today, from our friends at North Carolina Farm Bureau comes the story of Dennis Martin. Like most of his peers, Dennis loves the farm life and in 2016 was recognized for both his service to the agricultural community and his many years of teaching and encouraging young farmers. As you're about to see, two things Dennis is very passionate about. One, his Charlet cattle, and two, the public's misconceptions of farmers like himself. To, to begin with, what made you just to choose this breed? Well, I, I really just like to color white cows, but I also knew it, you know, in the 1970s, they were gaining pretty fast in popularity, and I wanted to kind of be in on, on that new popular thing, and so uh, just chose Charlais for that reason. Well, all, all of the original Charlais that came over from France were horned, oh. but through the years, we've uh, like most other breeds, we've kind of bred the horns out of them, but the horn gene is still there, so it shows up sometimes. Uh, well, the number one question is, do your cows eat grass? <laughs> but also, you know, I get questions about GMOs and, and, uh, and you know, organic things, or, are you an organic farmer? Uh, just a lot of questions like that. What, as, as a farmer, what sort of upsets you sometimes about the public perceptions of who farmers are and where their food comes from. Because there's so many myths flying around yeah. the internet and what people can see. Is there anything that bothers you in particular, upsets you, or is there anything that's that's just so wrong? It's like, well, I guess I guess the main thing is just, just the public's lack of knowledge about food and how it's grown. Uh, for example, a real nice looking lady one day wanted to buy some marrow bones. And, and when she found out that I gave my cows a little bit of grain each day to go along with the grass, she wouldn't buy them. And, uh, you know, as soon as she left my booth, she went and bought her a donut from the donut vendor and started eating the donut. And I wanted to ask her why it was okay for her to eat, to, for her to eat grain, but not okay if my cows ate some grain. No, I think it's, uh, you know, I think they need the extra nutrients uh, that grain gives them. And, uh, I think it, you know, they, they just produce and grow better. What do you think is the, um, the most important thing the public needs to know about farmers and what they do and what they grow and produce? Uh, that, all, that all food grown in all the different ways we grow it is safe to eat. Uh, you know, whether you're an organic farmer or a biotech-based farmer, uh, I think all food we produce is safe to eat. Mom and dad are in their 80s, and both as healthy as they can be, and they've ate, you know, they've ate uh, yeah. our beef their whole life. So. And what is it about farming? I know you said it goes back generations, but what is it about farming that you that you love? Oh gosh, that's a hard question. You know, it's just nothing better than to go to the pasture in the morning, find a find a new baby calf. You know, and just the pleasure you get from knowing you worked hard all day belling hay or something like that. I just wouldn't want to change it for any, anything else. Great story. That's going to do it for this week's edition of the Farm Monitor. Now, here's a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm. Be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed and see what's up in the world of farming and with us here on the show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Farm Monitor. Have a great week.